So we now move on to the next session on, on the economics um, of transform climate change transformation pathways. And we're looking both at the, uh, here at the economics of, of mitigation as well as the economics of uh, climate damages, uh, also trying to understand uh, or getting latest research on, on the benefits uh, of, of mitigation. Shinichiro Fujimori uh, from Kyoto University um, and uh, Shinichiro, the floor is yours. Okay, so I, I am going to talk about uh, the conditions for low carbon uh, green growth, uh, which is actually mostly a, a focusing on the mitigation, climate change mitigation. Process. So uh, let me briefly go through the current understanding of the uh, climate change mitigation cost. And as you might have already recognized, uh, climate change mitigation cost could be a, a concern for the uh, actual uh, movement to the uh, carbon neutrality in society. And just recently, uh, Alex uh, published uh, a related paper in Nature Climate Change. And, uh, but uh, so far, I think uh, this is uh, particularly observed in IPCC report uh, that uh, in the past, uh, energy and land use uh, physical uh, information are quite uh, well described, while um, economic side, uh, cost uh, metrics are not, uh, of course it's, it's shown, uh, but not well uh, investigated uh, so far. And and, and I also I think there are uh, several uh, papers that, have, uh, that discuss this uh, about the total of climate costs, including the climate change impacts and the covenant of the climate change mitigations. And, uh, but uh, let us uh, uh, look, look at the uh, recent IPCC reports, uh, in particular, uh, focusing on uh, mitigation costs. Uh, I, I took uh, a representative uh, figures from uh, the AR5 and uh, one, SR1.5. And unfortunately, uh, uh, we cannot get the uh, GDP loss of consumption loss or additional energy system cost uh, metrics uh, in SR1.5, but uh, in AR5, uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, left-hand side figure, which shows you know around uh, three to 5% uh, or so or it need to be at least, you know, or for or attaining a uh, two degree climate situation. And perhaps uh, 1.5 would have a uh, uh, bit larger than this. Of course, uh, the model has been improved from the uh, air five and uh, this uh, scale might be different uh, in the uh, latest uh, forthcoming uh, uh, IPCC reports, but in uh, the uh, rough uh, sketch of the uh, uh, mitigation cost would be something like that. And so uh, based on that, uh, what well, we had a research question uh, is something like this. So climate change mitigation uh, would be costly, but uh, how can be uh, moderated or offset by some uh, so social or transformative actions? Uh, and uh, related researches have been carried out, for example, in uh, Arnold's paper where they investigated the low energy demand uh, without relying on uh, CCS. And, and dead reef work, uh, which has also a uh, 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 focus on uh, social transformative actions in, in various uh, sectors, which uh, may in turn, uh, uh, the reliance of the negative emissions would be quite small or even uh, without the variance uh, could be achieved. And so or we might be able to do a similar way, but uh, focusing on the mitigation cost. What if we could have such kind of measures then mitigation, you know, how much would be? And we implemented our uh, AIM uh, model, uh, AIM hub, uh, computable general equilibrium model. And assuming uh, basically four kinds of uh, social transformative uh, measures, uh, uh, listed here, like energy demand change, energy supply side change, and food dietary shift, and uh, investment. And and uh, finally, the fifth one is uh, all our measures are, are integrated into a single uh, assumptions. And other than that, uh, SSP2 social conditions are assumed. 
And we mainly focus on, on net present value of global total GDP loss uh, accumulation of uh, the period from 2020 to 2100 uh, with the consideration of uh, discount rate. And we, we try to quantify the scenarios uh, 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 covering uh, the 1.5 to 2 degree climate uh, change stabilizations. And, and uh, to do that, uh, uh, climate policy side, uh, we set a carbon budget from 500 to 1,400 uh, from 2011 to 2100, uh, which it might be slightly different from the uh, uh, the forthcoming AR6 definition of 1.5 and a 2 degree stabilization. But anyway, we set uh, these uh, 10 uh, conditions for uh, climate side. And the other side is a social transformation side, which I mentioned as uh, four or sector or measures plus integrations. And here is a default without changing any additional functions. And let me move on to the results. Uh, so this is the default scenarios uh, are the uh, indicators like GDP loss, uh, GDP loss rate and emissions uh, in CO2 and Kyoto gases. And uh, as you might be able to imagine easily, a you know, uh, gradual shift uh, from the lower side to the higher side uh, by increasing the ambition of the climate uh, mitigation. Um, uh, yeah, uh, emissions are also uh, similarly uh, opposite, you know, or the modest uh, mitigation of emission reduction to the great, greater uh, scenarios. And then uh, we, we computed uh, the GDP loss, uh, net uh, presented value. Uh, and here I he illustrate the net present value of uh, GDP loss against uh, cumulative CO2 emissions. Uh, and here we see a clear uh, you know, uh, correlation uh, with the uh, uh, degree of the ambitious ambition of the uh, emit deductions and and GDP loss, right? So if we have a stringent, uh, uh, like a 500 gigaton carbon budget, then uh, the mitigation cost would be larger than uh, the modest one. And let me start from the green uh, plot, which is the default uh, scenarios without uh, changing any additional uh, measures. And uh, this is uh, the uh, gray dots are uh, literature uh, values, and so I we confirm that uh, our default scenarios would be a kind of a, uh, within the range of the literature. And then uh, we would have a additional uh, measures in, in like uh, energy demand side, supply side of food and investment and integrations like this. And individual sector uh, measures would have, uh, of course, certain uh, effectiveness to reduce the mitigation cost while they are limited. And when we have an uh, integrated uh, scenarios, which would uh, be uh, meeting the condition of like uh, fully offset the mitigation cost. So until uh, like 700 uh, gigaton uh, CO2 budget, uh, it becomes a uh, negative cost, uh, but only uh, 500 and 600 uh, is uh, slightly larger than uh, uh, fully offset conditions. And this figure shows the uh, periodical uh, GDP loss uh, uh, taking, I think, a thousand uh, gigaton budget uh, cases. And so in the uh, former period, uh, uh, we still have a, a positive uh, GDP loss uh, while uh, the time goes to the longer term, uh, the uh, cost becomes negative which is uh, mainly caused by the investment uh, uh, factor. And uh, from the decomposition of the scenarios, we can get uh, which sectoral uh, measures would have an, uh, a greater uh, impact on this offsetting the mitigation cost. And the largest one is investment, actually. The, uh, the, the implementation of the investment uh, is 
putting additional uh, in, in the investment, uh, uh, taking the household uh, consumption. And uh, uh, if we look at the GDP loss, uh, it could contribute to uh, the uh, positive effect. And of course, there are uh, other sectoral measures would also have a, a positive impact uh, and energy supply would be the second and followed by uh, two others. And we see a, uh, almost similar tendency across the uh, uh, variations of the carbon budget uh, from 500 to 1,400. Uh, uh, the shape is quite similar. Uh, the degree is slightly different. And in particular, uh, near term, uh, the tighter budget would have a larger mitigation cost. Therefore, it, the, the results showed like you know, fully offset would be difficult for these uh, 500 and 600 scenarios. And we did um, decomposition analysis by sectors. I, I, I would like to skip, uh, but briefly, he, he, he took uh, the results, which is you know, service sectors, uh, GDP, a barrier to recovery is the main contributor, and industry is the second one. And, and uh, we also uh, carried out the uh, climate change impact, uh, a consideration of the climate change impact and a pollution co benefit, uh, which is. Uh, uh, Using the emulator economic uh, loss, uh, economic damage emulator uh, caused by uh, Takakura et al., and using the GeoScan, uh, which is the uh, uh, transport chemistry atmospheric model, uh, plus health uh, impact assessment functions. And uh, here I just uh, briefly look at uh, 2050s and three representative budget uh, scenarios. and. Blue, blue bars are showing the uh, mitigation cost in default, and the red one is offsetting uh, by the social transformative measures. And the others are uh, relatively minor. And therefore, uh, from this assessment, uh, we conclude that uh, even inclusion of these two factors, uh, the, over, the magnitude of the uh, social transformative uh, measures would be, be quite major and important to offset the uh, climate change mitigation costs. Um, but the, there are uh, several arguments. Uh, I think uh, GDP is not the uh, good metric uh, for welfare. Therefore, household consumption would be need to be, you know, uh, discussed uh, similarly. And uh, we didn't consider uh, the. Uh, inequality within the countries or within regions. We just uh, put the uh, total uh, mass of the economic performance. Uh, the, but uh, when we talk about green growth, uh, this shouldn't be avoided. Uh, therefore, uh, I put this and the natural capital is not accounted. And generational consideration would also be needed. And uh, as I said, uh, the per, uh, former period uh, would would still have a positive uh, GDP loss, while uh, the latter period would be quite offset or negative side. And therefore, there is, there is an unbalance uh, among the generations. So uh, this is the conclusion. I guess the time has already been coming. So let me stop now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shinichiro. Very interesting presentation. We started a bit late, so, so we do have time for one or two questions. Um, please raise your hand. I should um, just uh, open up the participant list here for me. We have almost 90 participants or put a question in the chat. Um, maybe I start with one and that's what you had on your uh, previous slide on consumption versus um, GDP. And I think that's particularly relevant for the investment effect you investigated. Yeah. So the first question would be what, how exactly did you implement it in terms of there was a higher investment than the, the welfare maximization would, uh, would suggest? Uh, was that the case? And then would it be true that then the consumption losses would be higher uh, for this investment implementation than in the default implementation? That's- uh, Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's really a really excellent point. And the actual assumption of the investment, additional investment is, uh, uh, 
uh, increment of 1% uh, of the investment is uh, additionally accu accumulated in, in, in that scenarios. And that means, you know, 1% uh, of the investment uh, is taken from household. And uh, actual uh, final outcome of the household consumption uh, is not fully offsetting the cost. Uh, and the changes are, are relatively smaller than GDP. And therefore, you know, we, we, when we look at the household consumption, uh, it's still, uh, uh, yeah, there is an, a distance to the fully offset conditions. That, that's my answer. I, I can uh, show you uh, if the uh, paper is published uh, uh, on, on that data on numerical. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Next presenter is for Franziska Piontek uh, from uh, the Potsdam Institute. Uh, on decomposing costs and benefits in integrated scenarios. Over to you, Francisca. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I will be talking about um, how to analyze integrated scenarios of climate change mitigation and impacts. And um, I don't actually think I have to motivate this very much because Celine did a beautiful job on Monday explaining on why we really need such integrated scenarios now um, to fulfill the demand from stakeholders, but also um, for the IPCC work um, to really answer this question of what are the benefits of mitigation, not only what are its costs. Um, and unfortunately, in this round of the IPCC, this literature isn't really there to answer this question. And so we need to prepare the way um, to really dive into this. And I think we are ready um, as a community because we now also have the scientific basis for that because we have a much more knowledge um, on the damage functions, on the economic damages, which we can take up. And there were actually some nice examples of that of emulators um, also yesterday in the impact session. Um, so comparing to um, what we are typically used to from the DICE type analyses, um, where we are presented with final optimal pathways uh, or social costs of carbon, um, we need to understand much more in detail um, the dynamics of such integrated runs, starting from the very beginning of what are actually the losses from inaction and then going from there to what are the residual damages once you do climate policy, and then what are all the steps in between, including how the damages affect um, the emission trajectories and the mitigation investment. And that has to be done in an integrated pathway to be fully consistent. And let's not forget the effect of uncertainty. We have to find a way to capture the uncertainty of climate and impacts in such an um, analysis framework. And so what we would like to um, develop in this, um, in this paper we are preparing is a framework which can be used to really uh, decompose these different cost components in open integrated run. Um, <clears throat> so when we start out um, with this, um, with a baseline without policies or damages and go to an integrated, um, in, to an integrated run, um, we first of all have a big loss, of course. Um, but already, if we now have include a baseline with damages, um, we can actually look at the loss from inaction. Um, so what is just the effect of damages if we don't do anything about it, but then we can also quantify um, the gain of the policy. So going uh, not only having the residual damages and the costs, but actually um, including in this, um, in this um, analysis also the, the damages we avoid um, by doing the climate policy. Um, additionally, we can look um, on both sides of the scheme, of course, on both components, namely the policy costs and also the damage side, the avoided damages or the residual damages. And if we do this with a process-based model, um, of course, that will require us to do a lot more runs than we are used to to really quantify these different components, uh, but it is um, well worth it uh, to really understand the dynamics. Now, we don't only want to look at cost-benefit analysis. Actually, by now, I think we, we know that this is not the best framework because of the large uncertainty um, surrounding impacts. Um, so what we would also like to look at is a, what we call the least total cost framework, uh, namely where we uh, not only include damages, but we also include a guardrail, so a policy target which hedges against, um, against larger damages, damages from catastrophic events, damages we don't know, tipping points, um, these kind of things. Um, if we have that set up, um, then we actually have a diff another level in this decomposition scheme um, meaning first we have the step um, from the baseline to the level where we have that guardrail. And then from there, 
um, we can go to the integrated runs by looking again at the different steps of what is the policy response to integrating the damages and then what is um, avoided, what, what damages are avoided by this additional step, or, and of course, always what are the residual damages. So it makes the scheme more complicated, um, but nevertheless, this lean total cost framework has, um, is, is clearly um, superior to just the cost benefit analysis, um, which depends strongly on the damage function. Um, I would like to show you some results, however, um, beware this is still work in progress. Um, and so these are preliminary results, um, but we are applying this framework um, to a set of scenarios we um, prepared for the network um, for greening the financial system. And I believe Elmar will actually talk about this activity more later in this week. And we are running the Remind Integrated Assessment Model in such a least total cost framework um, by having, by coupling it to um, the Magic Sea Climate um, Model and then a damage module which enables us to internalize the damages via the social, social cost of carbon, carbon while at the same time having a guardrail tax for a policy target. Um, in this exercise, for now, we only use one damage function, um, an empirical state-of-the-art function um, provided by Calcul and Dense. Um, this will be extended um, to include further damage functions in the future. And we have different policy targets, and we also have uncertainty from different climate sensitivities. Um, we are now looking um, at this framework by looking at GDP um, change. Of course, you can use also other measures, and I'll actually mention a, another measure towards the end of my talk. Um, looking at um, this part of the framework for now, we have the total loss in the red line, the residual damages, and the mitigation costs in blue and in green. And we have the low damage, medium damage, and high damage case uh, coming from the different climate sensitivities. It's always the same damage function, as I said. And we have here a baseline, so there is no mitigation there. We just have this loss of inaction quantified here. And then um, the different um, policy targets. And uh, you can see here that, of course, um, the, the mitigation cost component is stronger if we have a more stringent mitigation target. Um, if we have higher damages, um, the contribution of the residual damage to the total loss uh, becomes, becomes much larger. And we also see. Um, the, um, the time component and um, how the damages become um, more dominant towards the end of the century. If you look at um, this in net present value terms um, and comparing now not only the total policy costs, uh, but looking at the effect of internalizing this, so first of all, we see that internalization effect isn't so big. Of course, that um, depends strongly on what kind of damage functions and, and, and also what kind of uh, policy targets you choose. Um, what we can also see is that um, sometimes you get um, um, emission uh, reduction for free when you include damages because we have this effect that damages reduce, um, um, reduce your GDP and therefore already reduce emissions. Um, and so that is something which we normally don't take into account, but which has a certain effect. Um, we can try to quantify that effect by looking at the policy costs on the on comparing to the two different baselines, once with damages and once without damages. And you can see when we compare to the baseline, which already has damages in it, um, so already has somewhat lower emissions um, than the baseline without anything, um, then we, we reduce um, the, the quantified emission, the mitigation costs reduce um, by up to 10%, depending on what damage function and what kind of target you, you, you use. Um, of course, that just is just an aggregate damage function here. This does not actually quantify um, effects um, which um, on, on mitigation potential, uh, like on mitigation um, uh, technologies or bioenergy or things like that. These detailed process-based effects are not included here, and which they, they would have, of course, a full role. Um, looking at the, at the avoided damages now, um, we have the avoided damages in blue. Um, if we compare them to the mitigation costs, um, they, um, we, we have clearly this benefit here, um, which, we, which we need to show um, also um, to really um, show why, we, why mitigation is justified. Um, you can see that also the residual damage, uh, while the avoided damage 
becomes, of course, much larger, the larger the damage is, also the residual damage becomes more dominant. <clears throat> um, finally, um, I want to show you a result from um, the COACH project um, with another measure. Um, so another measure uh, we, which might really be good to use in this analysis is the balanced growth equivalent. Um, the balanced growth equivalent um, is a measure which helps to quantify um, the welfare change between different policies. It helps to make this more tangible. Um, so instead of using GDP or consumption, we can, we can use this um, as, um, as a measure. Um, here we have uh, results from the COACH project um, where we uh, conduct with multiple integrated assessment models across the benefit analysis using the new um, process based of a bottom up, bottom up um, damage function coming from the coach model that also has uncertainties from, from different sources. So we have again here a low, medium, and high damage case. And we look at the, the loss from inaction again, the net policy gain, um, which includes the avoided damages and the net loss without the avoided damages um, for these different cases. In terms of the balanced growth equivalent, um, you can see that we here see. Um, for the higher damage cases, this is clearly net, net policy gain in this measure. Um, the nice thing about this measure is um, that you can, it, it lends itself well to take into account the uncertainty. Um, so we can actually compute, combine these three different cases uh, in the certainty and balance growth equivalent um, by assigning probabilities to them and then computing expected welfare measures, um, which then can be combined in this uncertainty and balanced growth equivalent. And um, that is something which will help us to tackle this question of uncertainty. Um, running out of time, very briefly, the, the conclusions, we believe that a detailed analysis of all the components of loss and gain is very important to understand the dynamics. Um, it will require additional model runs, um, um, but we provide this, this framework, which will hopefully make um, the analysis of these runs more comparable um, across models and across studies and will be helpful for model in the comparisons of integrated runs as well. Um, the baseline is very important, of course, including damages uh, in the baseline as a comparison point is, is crucial. Um, also note that adaptation will, of course, increase this because then we have we don't stop at the level of residual damages, but we then add uh, adaptation costs and benefits to this, which will make it more com com complicated. Um, in communication, it, um, yeah, the, the uncertainty question it will be really crucial. Um, however, we believe it's important um, that we will account for this uncertainty in these integrated runs. So actually always use different damage functions when, 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 when doing this. And finally, echoing what Celine also said, improving the understanding of the effects of damages on mitigation is really important. Thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot, Francisca, for this interesting presentation. We have two minutes for, for um, questions. I already see one uh, in the chat, um, and that's from Jay. And Jay asks, what discount rate did you use to for your estimates of costs and benefits? Um, here I used 3%. Um, actually, that's different for the code runs. We used 1.5%. Um, so yeah, it, you can, of course, use different things. OK. Those are questions. I, I may have one, I'll just make up their mind. Uh, so how many runs in addition uh, do, does one need to do in order to, to get to this decomposition? Well, I guess um, it depends um, which components you want to look at, right? I mean, if you want to um, really identify all of these components, then um, in addition to to these two you might normally have, you need all of these additional ones. So I don't know how many, these are seven or something, uh, but it may be enough, um, for example, um, to, to, you could skip this one and only do this one. And then you have the policy costs together and the residual damages. So it depends a little bit on, um, on, on what components you don't always, I think, have to do the full scheme. It depends on, on the question you want to ask, but to do some decomposition, um, I think is really important. Okay, great. So there's one other question in the chat now, which I read, and then we would move to the next presentation. 
and that's from Urs Wood. Um, can you evaluate different timings in mitigation pathways to net zero from your framework and then identify optimal pathways? Um, that's a, a good question. I don't, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it. Um, I mean, that. I mean, in the, the integrated run, in a sense, determines um, the timing. So I'm not sure. Um, that, so we set the, the target and we internalize the damages and the damages affect the timing. Um, we, we know that from, from previous group. I'm not sure. Maybe I don't quite understand the question. Maybe we can discuss it in the chat. Maybe. Thanks again, Francisca. Let us move on to the next presentation of the economic session. Um, and that's by Kai. Uh, on the macroeconomic assessment of updated damage functions. So over to you, Kai. Okay. So uh, indeed, so today I want to uh, to have a look at um, at some some work that we did in the coach project. And um, where is it? Here it is. Um, so in the coach project, we um, we produce new damage functions, and these damage functions are then put into different uh, integrated assessment models to see the macroeconomic assessment of these damage functions. And we did that with multiple teams that are mentioned here. Uh, so teams from uh, CMCC, from uh, PBL, and from PIC. And um, what we did specifically is uh, that we have new inputs, so these newly created damage functions that Francesco already told in the impact sessions, if you were there yesterday. Um, we have uh, also some socioeconomic assumptions. Uh, all these harmonized assumptions are then put into three different integrated assessment models of different uh, complexity, uh, Mimosa, Remind, and Witch. And Mimosa is a, is a new one, uh, but it's based on FAIR. And uh, we, uh, from all these models, we produce the same output, namely GDP impacts. We do cost-benefit analysis, and we look at some policy implications. Um, specifically, at these inputs, uh, this is an, uh, a plot of the, of the world's new damage function from the COACH project, which is a bottom-up damage function created using all kinds of uh, different sectoral models, which are then put into a CGE, and then the result is this damage function. So that's really the starting point of this study. Uh, there's a large uncertainty there. Uh, and what is nice is that uh, we split it um, so we can have a nice consistent set of, um, of, uh, of le different levels of damages. So we have a medium damage function, which is the medium. We have high damages and low damages, which will come back throughout this presentation. And we also split it into temperature-related damages and um, non-temperature, so sea level rise-related uh, temperatures. So it's nice to have this split because the sea level rise has, comes on a different time scale than the direct temperature impacts. Okay, in this presentation, I will talk to talk at talk about three experiments. The first one is we look at an RCP uh, 2.6 or 6.0 and look at what the damages are. Then we do we combine that with the mitigation cost to do a cost benefit analysis, and finally we combine all the uncertainty to get some robust policy uh, advice using this whole range of damage functions. Now, for the first experiment, I show here the results from the RCP 6.0, the damages in 2100. Um, uh, in the and what, there's a few things that you can notice uh, already is that from this new damage function, the the global uh, average damages are around 10% of GDP, which is fairly significant. Uh, we also see that there are large regional differences, with Africa and Asia being uh, on the very high end of these damages. And we see that there are three different types of damages that we model here. So we call that the direct damages from temperature-related ones, the direct damages from, non from sea level rise, and the indirect damages. And the indirect damages are then really the GDP losses incurred in one year that accumulate over the years in order to get these indirect effects. And um, uh, what you also see is that uh, for the three different models, they are quite um, uh, robust. Uh, so the results are quite robust across the models because they show roughly similar, um, similar uh, damages. Now, one thing to note is that Remind does not model sea level rise and non-sea level rise um, separately, so we combine them into one combined damage function. That's why you see that it's striped in here. Or it does, I could go a lot more into detail. I could have a look at the different time scales at different levels of damages, damage functions, but for the interest of time, I will skip this and go directly to the experiment two. Um, 
it was it was like a warming up experiment. But this is the real experiment. Uh, it's the um, where you have these damages that we saw in the first experiment. Then we combine them with the mitigation cost from each model uh, in order to calculate this optimal discounted welfare. I don't know if you can see the bottom. Uh, oh, there it is. Might be better. Ah. Um, and this, these different mitigation costs is really the, the, the nice, thing, nice thing now is that we have different models that have uh, widely different mitigation costs. Now, if we combine that, uh, what we what I show here is the cost optimal, so the cost benefit emission pathway. Um, so these are in gigaton CO2 over time. Uh, and two of the models, so Mimosa and Remind, uh, go to a level which is um, well, it, it significantly reduces the emissions quickly, resulting in a temperature in 2100 of about 1.8 degrees, which is, um, well, uh, almost Paris um, compliant. Um, and uh, what, what we observed that still we go to these very low, de low temperatures, but without even reaching net, uh, net zero. And this might seem strange, but the reason for that is, and uh, Francisca already talked about, and uh, thought this, about this, and Celine also, that um, we, we do take damages throughout the century into account. And uh, so by taking these damages throughout the century into account, it means that it's, more, it's optimal to actually start reducing much earlier in order to avoid these damages throughout the century. Uh, so that's uh, the effect that you see here. And uh, you also see that the witch model is uh, slightly higher. Um, but that's mainly because they, um, they don't optimize over time. They only optimize the initial carbon price and then have an exponentially increasing uh, carbon price, uh, which results in a shift of, uh, of time in, a, in the timing difference uh, there. Now, this is for the medium damage function. We also did it for the high damage function. So if the damages are much larger on the high end of this, uh, this range, and then you, you get closer to 1.5 degrees as an optimal uh, cost benefit temperature. Uh, and you see that uh, the, we do reach net zero now uh, toward in the second half of the, of the century. Uh, so between these two experiments, nothing changed, only did the, the damage function change. Now we also did this with a low damage function, but that damage function is so low that we just are very close to baseline emissions there. So I'm not going to show that now. Um, we also, um, so we did a whole, uh, we did a damage function uncertainty analysis there, uh, or an uncertainty analysis, and the uncertainty from the damage function is around 1.5 degrees, so which is very high, it's really by far the highest uh, factor in the, in the uncertainty. The discounting uncertainty we varied it as well, and that uh, results in about 0.7 degrees of uncertainty, and the differences in taking sea level rise adaptation or not into account uh, results in about 0. 1 or 0.2 degrees differences in these optimal temperatures. Now that's for the cost benefit, um, but there are two with, well, more policy relevant metrics that uh, we also looked at. The first one is the BCR, the benefit cost ratio, and the second one is the social cost of carbon. And the benefit cost ratio is, um, is uh, very simple actually. We look at the benefits and we look at the cost and we see how they compare to each other. Um, so uh, specifically over time, we first look at the cost. So these are the mitigation costs um, until we show them until 2150 here. And um, so these are the, yeah, the mitigation costs of reaching the, the cost benefit path. Then we looked at the benefits, but the benefits are then, as Francisca already told, the avoided damages. Uh, so really the, the research, so the baseline damages minus the residual damages. That's the avoided damages, that's really the benefit, that's why you do mitigation. And what you see here already is that for the medium estimates of the damages, the avoided damages are just huge, especially if you, if you look um, beyond 2100, and that's why we, we actually extended the range until 2150. Um, but now we still have two uh, values over time. Uh, we will uh, transform them to a single value because it makes it easier to compare by discounting it, by taking the net present value of these with medium uh, uh, discount rate. Uh, we normalize the cost to one, and then what you see is that the avoided damages are about 1.9, so almost twice as high as the cost. So this leads to a benefit cost ratio of about two. Um, so that means, in other words, for every euro that you spend on mitigation, you get two euros back on avoided damages or on benefits, which is, uh, yeah, it's nice. Um, all right, 
that was the first metric. The second one was the social cost of carbon. Um, quickly show them here, social cost of carbon, you, you emit an extra pulse of emissions and you look at the marginal extra damages that you occur, incur throughout uh, the century. And um, here you, you see that for medium discounting, so 1.5% uh, pure rate of time preference, reach about $200, $250 uh, dollars, um, per ton CO2. And with lower discounting, this uh, becomes twice as high. Um, and so to put this into perspective, this is actually the, the um, well, this would be the optimal carbon price that we would have to put in in 2020 um, to optimally uh, mitigate uh, climate, climate change. All right. Um, last part, uh, very quickly. So we have different temperature outcomes here. For, so for medium damages, for high damages, for low damages, for different discount rates, etc. Uh, the question is now, OK, all of these are optimal in some way, but which one should you choose? So a policymaker would ask, which of these uh, paths uh, would we actually would we have to implement? Um, and to do that, we look at the third experiment, which is the mini max regret. Um, so we have we put now on the y axis uh, the temperature. So that's the policy choice. And a high temperature is optimal for low damages. A medium temperature is optimal for medium damages. And a low te temperature is optimal for high damages. OK, we know that from the, from the second experiment. But what if the damages turn out to be lower than expected? Um, then you incur a certain what we call certain regret. Uh, so if the damages are very low, but you did a lot of mitigation because you went to 1.5 degrees, then you have some regret because you did too much mitigation. For a high temperature, you will never have regret for too much mitigation because you hardly did any mitigation. Similarly, what if the damages are higher than expected? Then you also incur a regret, but then a regret from too little mitigation. And what you see is that this is actually worse than the regret from too much mitigation. Because for a high temperature, your regret can become very high um, because you did too little mitigation compared to the case where you did too much mitigation. And this mini max regret method, it then looks at the worst case scenario. So what is the worst that could happen for a certain policy choice? Uh, so that's a maximum of the too little or the too much regret. Um, for high temperatures, it will be the too little regret. For low temperatures, the too much regret. And then you, the optimal, cost, uh, the optimal uh, least regret uh, option would then be the, of the policy choice that minimizes the maximum regret. That's why it's called the mini max least regret option. In this case, uh, using the whole uh, coach analysis, the least regret policy would be uh, the policy uh, scenario going to 1.8 degrees. And that's a robust uh, uh, metric given the uncertainty in the damage function. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope looking forward to uh, questions if there are. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kai. Great presentation, very interesting. We already have one question in the chat, uh, and that is a question by Willem Verhagen, um, who asked whether it would be possible to regionally break out the uh, cost-benefit ratio um, and have one for OECD countries, for example, on one for Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Willem, for the question. Um, well, we could, uh, because we have the damages on the, regional, on the regional level, but the cost on the regional level is something more complicated, and we do have that. Um, every model reports it, but it's a tricky thing to uh, take into account because uh, you also you could have some um, emission trading and there's some um, equity principles that apply there that are like who is paying for whose uh, mitigation costs. And um, yeah, that was a, a topic that we, we didn't want to, uh, <laughs> to touch uh, yet, but it's a very interesting topic, but then you would really have to tackle the, the topic of who is paying for the mitigation for which mitigation uh, part. Right, yeah. Um, second question in the chat is on, um, uh, do you think you would reach net zero if you included damages from later dates? Okay, um, I'm not quite sure what, um, uh, Robin, what you mean with, um, with damages from later dates. Uh, so what we do now, we, um, for a single year, we look at the damages that, incur, that are incurred in that year, and we do that uh, th for, for the whole period until 2150. Um, and um, so in that case, we, yeah, we, we, the whole 
yeah, we, we don't just uh, optimize the, the, the final value, but we optimize like the total discounted uh, uh, little parts of these, uh, of these costs of, and damages. Uh, so in that sense, um, we already take that into account, but uh, I might uh, be misinterpreting the question. Sorry. Yeah, I guess the question is a bit about how dependent is uh, the, the trajectory, the optimal trajectory on the time horizon. And then uh, what I'm hearing from you, it's not too much. You're already going out to... to yeah, 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 not too much. Yeah. Since we're discounting that at some point, if you go further, then it's it's all discounted away. And uh, that's uh, what uh, matters too much. Right. And one last question from Brian. Um, do all the results assume no adaptation? Uh, or is there some adaptation included here? Yes, the, the adaptation question is a great question. And um, we always struggle a little bit with that. So uh, first of all, we uh, assume sea level rise adaptation. That's the easy part uh, that I can answer. Uh, for the rest, it's um, no, we, we don't take explicitly adaptation into account for the other sectors. Um, uh, but that's, um, yeah, it's a little bit unclear because it depends on the different impact models that we used in order to create these damage functions. And so uh, well, the, the true answer is that we are not quite clear on whether or not uh, all these uh, um, impact models uh, include adaptation, but nothing explicit except for the sea level rise adaptation.